Uh, all right. Uh, thanks. So that now that brings us to the to the two poems themselves uh, that we asked the students to read. What would you like us to know about them? Great. Yeah, absolutely. So the Sermon on Word Plan does not come from in the Mecca, but obviously it's related to the second Sermon on Word Plan, right? The one is the first, the other is the second. And I'll start with the first. The Sermon on Word Plan, it's worth noting from the jump, is deeply interested in chiasmus, right? This is marking it in a longer African-American literary tradition, because chiasmus is actually one of the most important rhetorical devices for African-American literature. Chiasmus, right, the famous example is Frederick Douglass. Quote, you have seen how a man was made a slave, you shall see how a slave was made a man, right? This is the sort of important turning point in Frederick Douglass's autobiography, right? And from there, chiasmus becomes quite essential to African-American literature as a rhetorical device. In this poem, we have, quote, the river turns and turn the river, right? River and turns are in this direction, and then we flip, turn river, right? So the poem's interested in a kind of reversal, but also in which the two things, the two poles remain related, right? If Frederick Douglass tells us that, tells us through chiasmus that man is made into slave and then slave is made into man, right? That's There's a kind of classic reversal there where the first half describes Douglass's degradations of slavery and the second half describes the process by which he becomes free, right? This poem is similarly telling us from the beginning that it's part of a longer African-American tradition and there's some kind of reversal that you're supposed to be paying attention to, right? Uh, and I think that this more or less structures the poem, right? We have that line, quote, our something in double pod contains seed for the coming hell and health together. Hell and health would seem to be opposites, right? But there is a kind of joining. We know that from the word together. We also know that from the sound, right? Hell is the first syllable of health, right? So these two things are separate. There's going to be some kind of reversal of what we expect but also the sort of note that health includes hell tells us that health kind of includes and exceeds hell, right? If, as I was mentioning earlier, much of in the Mecca is telling us that people are not separate from the violence that they experience, right? And yet they are still valuable. Health is inseparable from hell in this poem. And yet health is more than the hell that it contains. Yeah. Then we move into the imperative in the poem. Right, which is still trying to get us at this understanding of vulnerability as a kind of necessary condition for Black people, but still not inter entirely determinant of Black personhood. Right, We have, quote, prepare to meet sisters, brothers, the brash and terrible weather. And then later, right, but oh then the stuffing of the halls, the seasoning of the perilously sweet, the health, the heralding of the clear obscure. Prepare to meet the bad weather, right? It's coming. There's no avoiding the climate, right? We all live in it, in fact, right? And indeed, we should prepare ourselves for it. But Brooks is also reminding us that there's something that might be gained from that experience, or at least something that's valuable, right? From having experienced the bad weather, right? The health is made even more valuable by having endured hell. The health is like the sweet which is by necessity perilous, right? Perilously sweet, it's dangerous, right? This is effectively the kind of understanding of, you know, the relationship between anti-Blackness and Blackness that structures the second sermon on Warplan and much of the Mecca, right? These two things, for the people who are descended from enslaved people, right? There's no kind of pretense for Brooks. right? Anti-Blackness is kind of a necessary part of modern life. It is foundational, it gave birth to the Black diaspora, right? Those things are yoked together. And yet, right, she still insists that we ought to, you know, build our church at the end of that poem, right? That there is something to be built. There's an institution that's still valuable that can be made on that foundation, right? <laughs> second sermon on the Warpland, I think, or sorry, second sermon of Warpland, I think, is after a kind of similar... Point. This is, I think, what I want you to sort of understand, right? That the Blackness, Black life in America, according to Brooks, is constituted, right, by vulnerability to violence, and yet it's still in excess of it, right? That poem begins, quote, this is the urgency, live, and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind, right? The blooming's not separate from the whirlwind. It's in the whirlwind. Indeed, 
<clears throat> blooming a sort of figure for a flower, right, might appear to be quite fragile, and yet she still thinks it's possible, right? What's more, blooming as a figure is more than simply living, right? It's more than its utility, right? It's bloom, right? Thrive, right? That I think helps us understand a little bit of the less of the rest of the poem, right? We again have a kind of imperative commanding verb tense, right? Quote, stylize the flawed utility. Prop a malign or failing light, <clears throat> right? Stylize the flawed utility. You have a thing which is perhaps broken, yet you still can make it styled, right? You can still give it a kind of aesthetic, a kind of cool. I mean, of course, right, much of the latter part of the 20th century in African-American culture would be dominated by a music that was created from poverty, right? Hip hop, right? Um, that music, right, you might think about as kind of stylizing a flawed utility, right? Propping a malign or failing light, right? And yet, she continues, right, no, the wind is our commonwealth, nevertheless live. All about are the cold places, all about are the pushmen and jeopardy theft, live and go out. I'm jumping over the poem here, but you see what I'm saying, right? The world in which we live, like the world in which Pepita in, in the Mecca lives, like the world that she's describing in the first sermon, it's defined by violence, and yet she still commands that we make use of the broken tools that were given, right? It's lonesome, yes, she writes at the poem's end, for we are the last of the loud, nevertheless live. Conduct your blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. She's not only telling us to create use, right? I mean, again, blooming is that word for the process of a flower's yearly maturation. This is an action defined in part by the use of reproduction, but it's succeeded by that, right? It's not only for making more flowers, it's beautiful, it flourishes, right? Blooming is life, it's living that's use and also more than use. And it's in the midst of violence, but it's still more than that violence, right? It has to happen in the whirlwind, but it's greater than the whirlwind still. Indeed, it's maybe more beautiful because of it. We don't have the luxury of writing above the whirlwind, nor pretending that we're not within it, lest the tornado tear us apart. And nevertheless, she reminds us, right? We must live, we must live a life that is something more than useful, that's blooming, right? That's effectively a continuation of that kind of reversal from the first poem, <clears throat> but it's also more, right? It's helping us get at a sort of greater sense of life as something more than just use. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, thank, thanks so much. I've, I, and I'm, you know, I kind of want to share with the students that uh, part of, um, Part of what I, what I what I like about Slea, you know, I introduced the course way back at the beginning that it was part of what's weird about Slea on campus for Stanford students and those of us who teach in it is that it's part intellectual community and part part of class. Like there's stuff yeah. you got to learn, but then there's just a way of us being together as students and teachers and and so I'm just, I I can't help but. Um, uh, point out that, you know, uh, that you came, Elias, to this classroom last year, quoted from this poet that I didn't really know very well, and that by looking into her poetry and, and then teaching the course again, I <clears throat> came to a kind of structure that I've pointed out to the students a little bit uh, last week, week seven, that there's a kind of first part of the course where we're very much focused on um, I mean, to sum it up to Aristotle's idea of flourishing. So as, as, as this th a thought experiment of like, what does a human look like in their, in, when they bloom in their you know, kind of best form? But of course, without necessarily much about context and structure of life and society and challenges. And then with um, do the right thing um, and, and then go bridging into trying to do some marks to bring in that problem of, of the challenges of society. So there's an idea of blooming, but then there's there's the 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 environment in which we must bloom. Um, yeah. And so just, I mean, I just, I'd like to say that you move the course in that direction with it, with bringing this poem to my attention and that we, this is part of the um, richness of spending time with this kind of stuff uh, in, in conversation with other people. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, no, no, thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, I mean, the environment, it's always a problem, right? Because it's obviously unfair, 
<clears throat> right, in the poem, right, that there's a whirlwind, right, that the bad weather is coming, right, that Pepita dies, right. And whenever I teach this poem, I think that's, or these poems, I think those are the things that people have the hardest time with, right? Where it's like, yeah, but people shouldn't have to deal with that. Totally understandable response. Unfortunately, they do. Right, people live in the world. Yeah. And still, right, Brooks is, I mean, it's not only that Brooks is trying to find a way of thinking about life as valuable within that context, right? I mean, it's almost that it's more valuable because of the context, right? Mm -hmm. That the flourishing in the case of the chorus, right, becomes more meaningful because of context and because of problems actually, right? Right. Yeah, and so as we talked a little bit about a, a, a kind of closing question, I'd love to hear your answer to um, my, partly because of my own personal proclivities, this course has, has have been skewed heavily to a certain kind of philosophical thinking, the Aristotelian version, for example, or the Marx, we did a little Plato. We started with Antigone and we actually, spend a little time on the Ode to Man as a kind of poem in its own right. But as somebody who, you know, studies literature, um, what, what, how would you put what's on offer from, from poetry that maybe isn't in a, in, a, in a more formal philosophical text or something? Does that question yeah. make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, I, I maybe a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> you know, one is that, I mean, in general, I think all recorded things are important, right? Partially just because they can leave their context. You know, I say something to, you know, someone in passing on the street, it's gone, right? That's not, you know, there's no, that cannot leave that context, right? Um, and there is something about the poem being recorded that is really important, right? Brooks is writing in a particular context. She publishes on a particular press, but now I get to read that in 2023 now, right? and have it mean something entirely different to me, right? Travel to me in a way through time, right? That doesn't explain why poetry, but it does explain something about why sorts of like recorded objects, right? Poetry, I think, <clears throat> importantly, you know, there's this Audre Lorde essay, right? Poetry is not a luxury, <clears throat> where part of what she describes is the ways in which poetry can give voice to that which isn't yet thought or thinkable even, right? And there is something there, I think. I mean, I think often, what I find in poems predates the kind of like nonfiction thought by like 30 years, right? It's like, you know what I mean? The kinds of arguments that Brooks makes or the kinds of points that Brooks is making in these poems, those points are being made now still in African-American studies and by scholars, right? But she's doing this in 68, right? I mean, there's a way in which the poems are able to give voice to something that is not yet thinkable not even thought, but not yet think, right? Uh, so that the rest of us might be able to think it later. I mean, I do think in particular, the sort of verse form, the fragmentary form, that I think does a lot there, right? Also the oral, right? I mean, the way that poetry draws our attention to sound, right? It's not simply meaning, it's also quite importantly sonic, right? And sound is one of those things that is partially about use, but it's also more than use, right? Yes, you know, when I make certain sounds, they form certain words, they communicate meaning, etc. But there's also so much more there, I think, right? And the same goes for the sort of visual layout of poems, right? And then I think, you know, there's a way in which poems, this is an argument Kevin Quashie makes in this book, Black Aliveness, right? But there's a way in which poems can make people feel more alive. I mean, there is that sort of like concentrated experience, right, in the poem that if you're willing to put the effort into it, right, it can make you feel more alive, right, more human, right, and more than human. I think a lot of the sort of non-fictional argumentative stuff in the form of, you know, philosophical essays or what have you, all that stuff is great. I love it, but I relate to it as use, right? What have you taught me? Right. This, I think, is something more, right? That kind of living, that aliveness that's more than simply use. I think that's part of what poetry offers me, I think. Yeah. Thanks so much, Professor yeah. Rodriguez, on behalf of the extended high school classrooms here, one of which is in Topeka, Kansas, by the way. Oh, <laughs> shout out to Topeka. <laughs> yeah. um, great all to right. Thank you for having me.